so much for coming out. I have almost single-handedly destroyed Faith Academy because it went from how many people to this many to this many. But I'm pretty happy tonight because it, at one point it was my wife who's helping with the slides and Stephen who's paid to be here. So it's really, things are really looking up at this time. I'm very happy. Okay, did you all get a handout, please? I hope they're at the back table. And we're going to talk tonight about a basic primer on preparing and delivering a Bible message. How many of you uh, preach at all? Have ever done a sermon in it? How many of you plan to begin preaching? How many of you listen to sermons? Okay, that is what could be helpful to you tonight because I'm aware that a lot of you uh, don't preach and, and yet there are some things to learn about Bible communication that I think are extremely helpful. So I'm going to be talking a bit about how to study a text. That's the minor part. A bit about how to put a sermon together, but quite a bit about what does a quality sermon look like and how, how can you listen to it well? And I don't want to turn you into preaching critics. Uh, when I quit preaching regularly in 2012, I, would, I started going to a, a, a church down in Dallas where we lived, and I'm sitting there thinking, oh boy, this introduction is a train wreck. Oh my goodness. No transition. Oh boy. That is the worst conclusion I ever heard. So <laughs> the Lord slapped me on the head and said, Dave, the question for you is, what do I have for you this morning? It's not, was that a good conclusion or not? The question is, what do I have for you this morning? And I do my level best to live into that. So uh, with that said, my wonderful wife, Kathy, of 49 and a half years, is going to push these buttons, 49 and three quarters years, actually, is going to push that button and keep, keep up with me. And then uh, I'm going to pray for us one moment. And then we're going to start with, I need two volunteers as we begin. And okay, there's one. That's what I was hoping. Two. Thank you so much. And then we're going to do a little uh, exercise to try and teach the first part of what I'm doing. And then we'll move into our outline. So, Kim, grab, an, grab a handout right back there, ma'am. There's an outline. I grabbed it already. Never mind. <laughs> Here I'm giving instructions to people who are <laughs> way ahead of me. Lord, we're really thankful for this good day. I'm very grateful for these people. Lord, we want to honor you. Uh, we want to live for you. Uh, we want to be people who are serious about your word, about ordering our lifestyles according to your word, and about communicating your word to other people. Please guide us tonight as uh, we have this conversation, and we entrust the time to you in Christ's name. Amen. All right. <clears throat> Here's the first volunteer needs to get ready. Please um, ask you to memorize a list, okay? No, don't write it down, please. Here's your list. You're, you're, you're going to the grocery store and your wife is sending you for, for this list. You ready? One gallon of whole milk. Okay? That's your list. We're going to come back to it. So try to remember it. All right? Your list, young man. You ready? One gallon of whole milk, two jars of pickled jalapenos, one dozen eggs, one case of Diet Pepsi, one bunch of cilantro, three cans of ranch beans, one package of hot dogs, one package of Colby Jack cheese, two oranges, one half gallon of cookies and cream ice cream, four plain bagels, one jar of crunchy peanut butter, two avocados, one package of frozen corn, one tube of toothpaste, two bananas, one bag of corn chips, one box of matches, one box of Cheerios, one green pepper, one jar of ketchup, one tub of cottage cheese, one jar of tomato juice, one pound of coffee, one package of gum, one gallon of laundry soap, one can of cream of onion soup, two pounds of fresh salmon, three granola bars, one tabloid at the front checkout stand, one gallon of dis distilled water, one maple bar, one can of Rotel tomatoes, and one carton of half and half. All right? I'll be back to you. <laughs> what is your grocery list, please? One gallon of whole milk. That is excellent. And yours, sir? <laughs> that and a whole lot more. Okay. <laughs> Don't forget the ice cream. No human being could re remember that list, and especially as I rattled it off. It is a very important exercise to think about in communication. 
People cannot remember, remember uh, the 45 items on that list. And literally, we shop at the same Winco every time. And I sat at my computer this afternoon, and I thought about things at the diverse corners of that Winco. Now, I wasn't going to do it systematically, like all the vegetables, then all the whatever. I'm just going to go all over the world. And, uh, and obviously, Matt can't remember that. I can't remember it. I read it. There's no way. I wrote it. You can't remember all that. It's just too much. And it's a very important thing to start, uh, start on this uh, topic tonight. So number one, here's some basic, basic compu- communication uh, truths that are extremely important that, in my judgment, are utterly ignored, misunderstood, or unknown by the lion's share of Bible communicators. Less is more. Communication needs to be concise, focused on the essence. Uh, The best communicators have the discipline to leave out the stuff that is clever and interesting but doesn't help. It takes a lot of discipline to say, I'm not putting that in there. So we want to focus on the issue of the the essence, explain it, apply it. I, I heard a sermon. I still remember it. I still remember that I heard it. Scottsdale Bible Church... Uh, Scottsdale, Arizona, 25 years ago, a guy got stood up to speak. He was a guest speaker. They were without a pastor at the time. He was a guest speaker. He spoke for 50 minutes. I timed it, 50 minutes. And in that 50 minutes, he must have referenced 40 scriptures and 20 illustrations and several quotes from antiquities and it was all tied beautifully together, and he was speaking rapid fire, kind of like I read this list to Matt, and he went for 50 minutes, and it was an amazing integrated mess of mush with no structure, no idea, no direction. And when he got done, the people in the chairs applauded, and I sat there and thought, that was horrible. (laughs) That was impressive, but horrible. I didn't remember one thing. By the time I hit the back door, I didn't remember one thing other than that was impressive and horrible. A gallon of whole milk can be remembered. Number two, communicate a single idea and make everything you say support that idea. The best communication is one idea and the stuff that supports it. Uh, You're very lucky if people can take home one single simple idea idea. My professor Howard Hendricks used to say the average Christian gets a thimble full of truth out of the sermon and spills it on the steps as he leaves. You're just leaving with basically nothing. So I gave a sermon one time, which we're going to review at the end of this message on Psalm 73. And the big idea of the sermon is the nearness of God is my good. That's the one thing I want them to take home. That's the one gallon of whole milk. The nearness of God is my good. One of my friends heard that message. I have seen him probably five times over the last 15 years. And the very first thing he says to me is, Dave, the nearness of God is my good. I say precisely, Ray, exactly. He doesn't know what comes out of Psalm 73. He forgot that. He doesn't know how it's supported. He doesn't know who wrote Psalm 73. It's all gone. But Ray Nixon is still operated on the nearness of God is my good. Most successful sermon I ever gave because Ray remembers. The best sermons have one single message that people take home. Number three, it must be a message from the Bible. This is critical. (laughs) We have a lot of good ideas, but we don't have anything that holds a candle to the messages in the Bible, the ideas in the Bible. I have heard a lot of sermons preached that involve the pastor's great idea. He may have proof tested it with a little bit from a Bible, but it it didn't come from the Bible. He just tried to make it look like it did because he was standing in a pulpit on a Sunday morning. So, First bullet point, skillful study of the Word of God requires these things. Continual dependence on the Holy Spirit, personal diligence, training, practice, developing skill, a desire to understand accurately what God said. Those are critical. Now, giftedness helps a great deal, 
but it's not a silver bullet. It is not a silver bullet. If you have a person with all of these elements, they will be better than 95% of the preachers in America. If you have a person with these elements plus giftedness, they'll be in the top 1%. I've known a couple of people with all these elements. Dr. Haddon Robinson is my teacher in, in seminary, the most brilliant communicator I have ever personally heard. I've not heard every communicator. The man was unbelievable. He had all of this stuff, plus he had giftedness. Um, there's, there's a lot of elements you can have without a particular giftedness and still have an amazing impact. Next bullet point, quality writing communicates a single idea in each unit. I, I am not young enough to remember when they, I was taught how to write in grade school, but I know they taught me every paragraph should have a topic sentence and an explanation of that sentence and support of that sentence and then a concluding sentence. I don't think I ever wrote a good paragraph in my life, but a good paragraph has that kind of communication. If it's written well, you can come out of it and say, here's what that paragraph said. If the author had written a single sentence instead of that whole paragraph, here's what the sentence would be. So in Bible study and Bible communication, <clears throat> our goal is to study a single unit. And in literature, the unit is called the pericope. How many of you know the word pericope? Mrs. Gibson knows the word pericope. She may have heard me before. Pericope is a fancy literary term that means a single written unit of thought. All right? So when I'm preaching, I want to preach a single pericope. I don't want to do like four stories together because they all have different units of thought in them. All right, so a, peri a pericope in the Bible could be a single Bible narrative like, like Jesus healing Bartimaeus. It could be a single psalm like Psalm 1 or Psalm 150. Could be a single didactic or preaching or teaching paragraph. Romans 8, 1 to 8, 2 Timothy 2, 1 to 7. Could be a single verse or a group of verses from Proverbs. Uh, Proverbs 24, 30 to 34. I pass by the field of the sluggard and by the vineyard of the man lacking sense. Behold, the wall was broken down and it was overgrown with thistles. Then I reflected and I thought about it. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of your hands to rest, and your poverty will be upon you like an armed man and your want like a bandit. Those are five verses out of Proverbs that go together. They are one pericope, one idea. You can't put every five verses of Proverbs together. <laughs> you will be all over the map. But it could be one verse, it could be four or five verses. It could be a single dream that Joseph had, uh, anything that's a unit of thought in the Bible. The best Bible communication studies a single pericope and teaches the idea behind that pericope. Quality communication seeks to study, understand, structure, and communicate a single pericope and thus a single idea. The philosophical thought behind this is we don't always write great paragraphs or great pericopes. But the Holy Spirit always does. He never wrote a paragraph and stood back and said, ooh, that's not good. He never did that, and he never will. And so if I look at a single pericope and understand what it is in the Bible, then I can uh, have an understanding of, of figure out what that idea is going to be. Now, there's times to, to teach a topic in the Bible, like um, everything the Bible has to say about repentance, or overview an entire book, of course, um, outline everything the book says about uh, some single topic, that would be a really limited topic. Uh, but in every case, a single message has to have a single idea. Slide, please, darling. Here's some outstanding resources for dealing with the issue of Bible study and learning how to do Bible study and Bible communication. Uh, the book called, this book called Living by the Book by Hendricks and Hendricks is the Bible on Bible study methods. It is a brilliant book. It is a fat book. Prof. Hendricks uh, made famous a Bible study method that he did not invent called observation, interpretation, application. How many of you have heard that before? 
a number of you have. It's the Bible study method I learned in seminary in the 70s. I use it all the time. It is purely brilliant. It was invented by a woman named Olita Wald, who wrote the first book about it, a little booklet called The Joy of Discovery. And Parf Hendricks was, was influenced by it, and then he wrote it uh, into, his, into his bigger book, and he gives her full credit for it, but it is a brilliant system for Bible study. How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth, uh, Dr. Gordon Fee. Biblical Preaching by Haddon Robinson. This is my preaching hero. Uh, this is the Bible on preaching. It's used in 400 seminaries and Bible colleges around America today. Uh, Haddon Robinson passed away around eight years ago-ish, something like that. Uh, so so he's, he's in glory now, but this book is, is flatly brilliant. A couple of free resources that are amazing, Bible.org. This is a robust, huge website that you could never read everything off of it, mostly populated by professors from Dallas Seminary, not exclusively, and just a ridiculous amount of quality content. The Blue Letter Bible app. How many of you know the Blue Letter Bible app? Okay, I find it extremely helpful. Um, I, I have another resource called uh, Logo Software, which I'm, I'm not motivating you to get because it's expensive and it's robust and this other stuff will, will do just fine. But the Blue Letter Bible app is amazing because you can click on the verse you want and then you can click on interlinear con concordance on your phone with your hand and then it'll take you to the, to the passage in the Greek or the Hebrew and then you click on the word you're interested in, and it populates a word study of that particular Greek or Hebrew word that used to take me as a student in the 70s eight hours to do. We had four huge books. They taught us how to do it. It took eight hours to do what you can now do with click, click, click. It's unbelievable. Blue, blue letter uh, Bible app. Um, number four, please. Are we okay, honey? Are you with me here? Yeah. Show your listener the essence or the core, the you must not miss this central idea, central truth of this idea. <clears throat> I, when, when I'm counseling people who are going into a particularly difficult conversation, either it's, it's tense or it's, it's angry or it's confusing or, or whatever, it's a difficult conversation that they're dreading, my counsel has become over the last 20 years, figure out the essence of what you need to say to this person, craft it in a highly wordsmithed single sentence, have the conversation, and say that highly wordsmithed single sentence 18 times in an hour. Whatever the message is that they must not miss, figure it out, make it clear, and then say it 18 times in, this, in the hour. Because that night, after the whole conversation is over, and some of these go for three hours, they'll lay down and they'll say, Dave said this 18 times. And they'll think about the one thing they need to think about. Everything gets lost in a three-hour conversation. But if you said something 18 times. So I'm telling you that story to say, when we're communicating something, I think it's extremely important to get to the essence of it, even make it into a wordsmith single sentence like the big idea, and say it 18 times if you have to. Number five, please. People are changed by epiphany and not by information. When they have an aha moment, when they see something, it motivates change. Charts, graphs, Studies, details, numbers, all manner of information. It just, it's hitting your head like Chinese water torture. You just can't even keep up with it. Uh, people are changed by epiphany when the aha moment comes on and they say, oh, oh, that causes change. The, the American Ad Council had a, an ad decades ago. They were trying to show how much sugar is in soda. They were trying to motivate kids to stop drinking so much soda. And they could have said, okay, there's this many grams of sugar in a soda, and if you, if you drink this, you're going to gain two pounds a week. And, you know, I mean, you could go into all the charts and the numbers and the calories and, and all of it. 
But what they ended up doing was they took a can, a, a bottle of soda that was tipped over and pouring out, and there was soda coming out of the bottle, and it was in this big glass, glass that it was going into, and as soon as the soda got to the glass, it turned into mounding, ugly, yellow fat. It was horrid. Beautiful soda coming out here, but when it hit the glass, it was like this fat coming out of it. Aha! I remember this from 25 years ago. I have no idea how many grams of sugar in a Coke. I have no idea. It means nothing to me. But I remember that. It's the epiphany moment. People are not changed by information, but by epiphany. Number six. People are changed by emotion, not by facts. Uh, I can tell people hundreds of facts, and they're sitting there saying, that's interesting, that's interesting, that's interesting, that's interesting, and go home and say, yeah, it's a bunch of interesting stuff. I can't remember any of it, but it was interesting. Or I can get them to feel something. Now, disclaimer, I am not arguing that you become, or any communicator become a, you know, uh, widow on Christmas Eve and the puppy story kind of stuff. <laughs> How many of you know the widow on Christmas Eve and the puppy? You do. Ma'am, you know a lot, don't you? <laughs> More than you wish. Okay, so um, we're at a citywide service, Idaho Falls, Idaho, 20 years ago. A, a guy's preaching, and the citywide service is on Palm Sunday, and he gives a brilliant, beautiful Palm Sunday message. It was wonderful. And he ends it by saying this. I've got to share this illustration. It's so good. It really doesn't fit here. Which is your first clue that we're about to go in the ditch. It has nothing to do with Palm Sunday. But I heard this great story about a woman whose husband died in July. And then Christmas Eve came and there's a knock on the door. And the boy from the pet store is there and he's delivering this gorgeous little puppy. It's only three weeks old. And the boy says, your husband, before he died, came in and bought this puppy uh, paid for it ahead of time so you would have it on Christmas Eve and not be sad. Uh, I'm not advocating that kind of stuff. <laughs> that is not the kind of stuff I'm talking about. Don't try to do emotion, over-the-top emotion for the sake of emotion. I am saying if you can hook a person's emotion, if you can cause them to feel concerned or happy or angry or, or compassionate, you can motivate change. When I worked for East West Ministries, my responsibility at the banquets was to stand up and say all the facts. And friends, there was a lot of them. When you're, when you're working in 51 countries and you're sharing the gospel this many times and this many people are trusting Christ, this many churches are being planted and this many pastors are being trained, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, there's, there's plenty to say. But I always, always, always minimize the number of facts. I gave the bare minimum and I always talked about impact. Because people are not changed by 10,000 people trained. That's wonderful. But we don't know them, and we don't know where they are, we don't know what training they got. It just doesn't help. Uh, I, I would end it with some story of some spiritual impact. I'm doing an evangelism backpack trip in northern India in the Himalayas. There's 10 of us. We're backpacking to the top of ridges, and then we're hopscotching down to homes of nominal Hindus where there's no road, there's no address, there's no mail service. If you don't backpack to their house, you don't see them. So I'm coming down this ridge, I come up on the back of a house, my translator and I go around the house and go in front of the house and there's a huge cement patio. And there's two people sitting on the patio. The homeowner, who is an Indian man who's a nominal Hindu, and a carpet salesman a 21-year-old Nepalese young man who traveled from Nepal over to India to sell carpets. And he's doing what we're doing. We're sharing Christ door-to-door, -door, and he's selling carpet door-to-door. -door. We come around the corner, and there's both of them sitting there. We told him we'd like to talk to him about relationship with God. They said, sit down. We sat down. We shared Christ. They both trusted Christ on the patio. Friends, I am a backpacking 60-some-year-old missionary from Dallas, Texas. I end up on a patio in the Himalayas, and a 21-year-old kid from Nepal is trying to make, an earn, make a living selling rugs, and he ends up on the same patio at the same time. 
I think God is up to something. God is always good, and he's always up to something. I don't know if anybody remembers me saying that, but I promise you they didn't remember me saying we trained 10,000 pastors last year. People are changed by emotion, not by facts. Number seven, in the introduction, <clears throat> you have to hook the listener. You have to hook the listener. We talk about turning voluntary attention to involuntary attention. The first 25 words are critical. You think, oh, wait a minute, Dave. We're better listeners than that. And the answer is no. No. All right? So I'm coming to preach, and I say, okay, folks, uh, last Sunday we looked at Ruth 1, and so this Sunday we're going to look at Ruth 2. Open your Bibles. How compelling is that? Let me guess, Dave. I'll bet next Sunday is Ruth 3, isn't it? You know. What's going on here? Last Sunday we looked at Ruth 1, this Sunday Ruth 2. But if I say, friends, this is a true story. When I was 21 years old, I wrestled a black bear in Yellowstone Park. Which sermon would you rather listen to? Of course, you're hooked. Now, I can't tell you the black bear story without having it fit the message, of course, but I've got to figure out a way to hook you, turn your voluntary attention, I'm sitting in the chairs, here's the preacher, I'm gonna look at him, figure out whether he has anything to say, or if I'm going back to my phone and TikTok. I've gotta hook you in the first 90 seconds maximum, the first 25 words are critical, and the, basically the way I do that is I ask a question, I raise a problem, or I create tension that you want the answer to. And once I have done that, I dare not give you the answer immediately. So this sermon we're going to look at here in just a minute is uh, Psalm 73. I'm going, to, I'm going to show you how I, how I worked to gain attention, and I asked the question, and after I asked the question, I did not give the answer immediately because I want people to stay with me until they get the answer. So uh, I, I said there, Americans uh, are distracted, undisciplined, device-addicted, they have the attention span of a child with ADHD on a sugar high. You may think that's a little harsh. I don't think it is. I don't think it is. I sit in my chair, I'm assigned seat back over there, first hour, they assign me to that seat. And I look at people, and there's a lot of this, friends, there's a lot of this going on, huge amount of that going on. Um, we're just not a disciplined culture anymore, sadly enough. Number seven. Uh, did I do number seven? Yes, I did. Let's not do that again. Number eight, quality messages have clear structure, distinct pieces. They're not a uniform rambling co collection of facts, references, illustrations, applications, anecdotes, and ideas. They have points, subpoints, conclusions. They are, they are, they are, there are pieces to them. It's not a single amorphous thing like the 50-minute deal I told you about from Scottsdale Bible Church. Number nine, Quality messages also have movement, direction, and progress. They are going somewhere. If you read a really good novel, it's moving somewhere. They're taking you along. You're saying, Where, what's going to happen? Where is this going? And you're following it. A good movie, you're going, ooh, this is interesting. I didn't see that coming. What next? And, and it's going somewhere. And a good message is going somewhere. Every well-told communication is going somewhere. And so the idea is, I want to take you on an intellectual, spiritual, volitional, emotional journey, and I want you to be aware that we're moving. Not that I'm just blah, 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 blah. And there, there's no pieces to it. There's no direction. There's no motion. There's no, there's no sense of story to it. Number 10, transitions are critical to good communication. This is a major issue in communication which many, many speakers ignore. I have to give you a verbal translation, transition to tell you we're moving to the next section. In finishing the introduction, for example, I have to say something that brings you along with me. So in my introduction to Psalm 73, I, I raise this question, what, what's the definition of the good life? I'll show you how I did that in a little bit. But then I have to say something like, friends, there's a man named Asaph who lived 3,000 years ago. He was a worship leader in the temple in Israel. And he has a brilliant discussion of the question, what is the good life? Please look at that with me. And I've tried to say to you, I'm done with the, with the introduction. Now we're going to go look at the text. 
and, and move you along. So a transition uh, has, to be, has to be crafted in such a way that I can link the sections together, I can show that we're changing sections, and I might be saying something like, and, or a transition could be therefore, or not only that, or to elaborate, or in contrast, in addition, for example, I'm saying something to you that says, okay, he's moving. And I'm not leaving you back thinking, oh, we're still in the introduction. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense. They just changed the, the, the slides to point three. I thought we were in the introduction, you know. It's clearly my mistake, it's my fault, because, because I didn't tell you to come with me. And sometimes outlines are not good enough for people to know, yes, we're going somewhere. Number 11, please. There's only four things you can do with a Bible truth or a sermon point. There's only four things you can do. You can explain it, what does this mean? You can illustrate it, let me show you a picture of what this is like. You can apply it, so what should we do? Or you can prove it, is this really true? Now in my experience, uh, many, many things need to be explained. Most of them need to be illustrated. All of them to some degree need to be applied and far less of them need to be proved. Now, there are certain things have to be proved. Like if I'm on a Sunday morning preaching in the platform and I know that half the people are not Christians because they're out here for Sunday Easter, I want to do my best to prove them that the resurrection happened. I want to give them some evidence that it happened. I want to, that's a piece of truth I want to prove if I can. But I ended up over the course of uh, 40 years of preaching doing far less proving. Uh, in my audiences, there was far less that had to be proved than stuff that had to be explained, illustrated, or applied. And as you look at a piece of material, you say, what needs to happen with this? And so when I'm doing a, a, like a major point in a sermon, I need to ask myself the question, does this need explanation? Is it not completely clear? Does it need illustration? Would it help if I opened a window up so they could look in and say, oh, that's what that's like? Does it need application or does it need to be proved? Uh, number 12, always apply the idea, always answer the question, so what should we do? That doesn't mean I need to be absolutely prescriptive about here's the idea from this passage for you must do this. I can give some examples of what a per person could do. I could give a bunch of choices of what they could do. But I also need to motivate people to say, listen, friends, God gave us this book so that we would be more like Jesus. Not so that we'd be more knowledgeable. Not so that we could win arguments with Mormons. Not so that we could win an argument with our buddy who thinks the, the rapture happens this time or that time. That's not the point. The point is to be more like Jesus. And if I hear a message or study a passage and I leave unchanged, I am mocking God. I am saying, I looked at your book, but well, I'm not going to do anything about your book. End of, end of the Sermon on the Mount. End of the Sermon on the Mount. Do you build your house on the sand or on the rock? If you're building it on the sand, when the storm comes, you're going to be washed away because you haven't applied the words that I gave you, Jesus said. And the interesting part about that, he doesn't say, if a storm comes. He says, when the storm comes. There is no storm-free place to build a life. None. Every life has storms. You have to be about two and a half years old before you know that's true. There's no storm-free place to build a house. It's either going to be a, a windstorm, a hailstorm, a sandstorm, a hurricane, a tornado, uh, a blizzard. There's no place to build a house that will not suffer storms. There's no place to build a life. And therefore, if I'm building on the rock, by responding to the word and by line by line, precept by precept, I'm becoming more like Christ because when I hear something from the Bible or read something in the Bible, I go out and say, what does that mean for me? How do I need to be a different person? This is a massive issue. So many people, friends, see the Bible as a academic, okay, now I know what to say to my Mormon coworker. Now I'm going to nail him, you know. That's not the point. I mean, obviously, we want to give a reason to count for the hope that's in us, 1 Peter 3. But the goal is not for me to hammer my Mormon friend. It's, it's not for me to 
win an argument over, over coffee break about that rapture. It's for me to be more like Jesus. Um, number 13, please. In the conclusion, I want to show them the idea in a way they have never seen it before. The exact same identical idea that I have been explaining, preaching, supporting. I'm not changing the idea. But I want them to see it in a new, more gripping, more epiphanal, more emotional way. This is the hardest part of quality communication, in my judgment. To me, the, illust the, the, the introductions are easy. I mean, as soon as, when I understand the idea, I can figure out an introduction easy. That'll hook, that'll raise tension, that'll orient to the subject, create interest. To me, that's easy. When I get to the conclusion, I've written the whole thing, I've studied the whole passage, I know the big idea, I know the introduction, I know all of it. But to figure out a way to make the idea so clear and so epiphanal and so uh, compelling, that is a challenge in con conclusions. Friends, I, I think conclusions are the, the major downfall of most, most communicators. I cannot tell you the number of sermons I've heard which said, let's, go all, let's all go out and live these Bible truths. Let's pray. I just want to jump off a bridge. That is the worst possible conclusion in the world. <laughs> How do you feel, Dave? How do you really feel about this? Um, and, and we're probably going to hear some in the next five weeks. Now, I hardly know Chad Kettler. I'm getting to know him. I'm having coffee with him this coming week. I really am impressed with the guy. He's unusually mature for a 33-year-old. He clearly loves the Bible. He loves the right things. He loves God, the Bible, his family, the people in this body, the lost. I am really impressed with this young man. And, and if he should happen to say in the next two months, let's go all go out and live these truths, don't turn and grin at me. Just say, yeah, I'm going to figure out a better application than that. I'm out of bounds, aren't I, honey? Pretty much, yeah. Okay, um, this is only being captured forever on the worldwide internet. But um, next slide, I'm out of numbers, but next slide. Foundational, def foundational definition of expository preaching by Head Robinson. Friends, if my diction is a little bad tonight, I had a massive tooth removed and air's going out where it shouldn't and my tongue's not being where it should. It just, it's frustrating. I find myself saying some stuff and going, that's not how you say that. Foundational definition of expository preaching by my hero, Haddon Robinson. Expository preaching is a communication of the biblical concept, the, the big idea, biblical idea, derived from and transmitted through, in other words, you had to get it from the Bible, historical, grammatical, literary, contextual study of the passage. When I study a Bible passage, I have got to understand how it fits in the history of its time. I've got to understand the grammar of the passage. I've got to understand how it fits in the literature of the Bible. Am I dealing with apocryphal material, a psalm, a proverb, didactic material, an imprecatory psalm, you know, God dashed their children against the rocks? What kind of literature am I dealing with here? And then also the context. Where was this written? Was it post-exilic? Was it uh, just, just after Jesus was crucified and he was still in the grave? Where is the context in the Bible of where this happened? Uh, the famous saying is this, a text without a context is a pretext. In other words, if I'm quoting you stuff that you don't know where it came from, I can pretty much do about it whatever I want with it. But if, it, if I tell you where the context is, then it's going to have a narrower meaning, and that will be uh, more important. So it, the Holy Spirit has first applied it to the speaker, and then he applies it to the hearers. So as a Bible communicator, if I am not serious about saying, so what for me, before I stand up to say, here's what the Bible says, I have done a huge disservice to you, and more than that, I've dishonored God. Because I've said, I'm a professional communicator. I'm going to tell these people what they need to do. But I've not been changed. This, 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 this single sentence here is ridiculously brilliant. I, I really respect what he's done with that. 
Next slide, please, honey. So our focus uh, on message preparation and delivery must always be these things, the glory of God, the need of the listener, and never how I, the communicator, look. This is a major issue, and there's a lot of people, especially young communicators, especially immature ones, who fall in the ditch on this. Uh, anybody know the name Vance Havner? Hal, Vance Havner was a American preacher in the 30s, 40s, maybe 50s, who said a bunch of brilliant stuff. He's utterly forgotten today, but uh, I have this quote on my wall. You cannot at one and the same time make yourself look clever and Jesus look great. That is spiritually brilliant. If I want to make Jesus look great, I can't be behind a pulpit trying to make myself also look clever. You can't do them both at the same time. You can do one or the other. And th this is a massive issue to say, why am I standing behind this lectern to talk to people about this Bible passage? I'm standing here to do this, number one, because God's a great being and he needs to get more glory. And number two, the people listening to me have need and they need to be helped. That's why I'm doing this. Why am I sharing the gospel? Because God needs more glory and these people need Christ. It's not because I need to look good or need to seem clever. Uh, uh, our goal in this work is then the glory of God, the pursuit of God, the transformation of ourselves, and the transformation of listeners. This is what we're up to in Bible communication. So, <clears throat> my stance or my approach with the listeners is extremely critical, friends. Um, my philosophical approach in this is, number one, it has to be hope-based. You can do this. I can do this. We can do this. God doesn't mock us by telling us to do stuff we can't do. God's not telling us to do this hard thing and then send, sitting up in heaven saying, oh, look at that, look at how bad Dave's messing this up. That's not his approach, that's not his heart. If he tells us to do it, we can do it. And I, I, I think it is critical that as a communicator, I am a hope-based person. Friends, we can do this, or God wouldn't have told us. He gave us the Holy Spirit. We can do this. Number one, hope-based. Number two, compassionate. Caring about the people to whom I am speaking. Their lives matter to me. It's a hard issue. It's Jesus seeing all the crowds and saying his heart went out to them. It's compassion. They were like sheep without a shepherd. He wept over Jerusalem. This communicator of, of, of the, the, the world has never seen, and he weeps over Jerusalem. Communicating as a fellow sojourner. In my judgment, a lot of speakers make this mistake. All the pronouns are you, 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 you. You need to learn this. You need to do this. You need to, you need to, you need to. I, I do my level best when I'm preaching to say we or I. Because I have heard too many communicators standing on a platform with all the you stuff, what you guys need to do. The message is, I've arrived. I mean, I went to seminary, I'm a pastor, I'm not ordained, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm something spiritually. But you guys, you need to shape up. It's hard to listen to that. It's hard to listen to that. I've actually spoken to a couple speakers at various times to say, it feels like we're being uh, spoken down to as the unwashed mas masses. We're all fellow sojourners. Nobody has arrived. Uh, every honest person says, no, I'm, I'm in the chairs. Okay, authentic, that is honest, but not inappropriately transparent. I need to admit to you that I struggle with stuff. Authentic, but not inappropriately transparent. Truthful about uh, my material and citing stuff that I borrowed. If, I, if I'm quoting to you something that's not mine, I need to do my best to say it. Now, that doesn't mean every last thing I say. I mean, I got some stuff in my head that I probably learned from a guy 41 years ago, and I forgot who the guy was. I can't do that. But if I would have stood up here tonight and said, listen, friends, one thing I always say is, you cannot at one and the same time make Jesus look great and yourself look clever. Without saying to you, that's Vance Havner. <laughs> it's dishonest because I didn't come up with that. Um, truthful about where you got material. Courageous and differentiated in hard sayings. 
<clears throat> differentiated is a word that means to say what's true and keep saying what's true no matter how much you're pressured to stop saying what's true. So there's a lot of Bible content. When you say what's true, it's hard to say and it's hard for people to hear. I thought Chad did a brilliant job a couple of weeks ago when he hit husbands and wives, you know. How'd you like to be here three weeks and have to preach? Sarah called Abraham Lord or Master, you know. That's not an easy one. But he did it. He stood up and did it. You know, he wasn't unkind. He wasn't, uh, you know, fundamental wives shape up. I mean, he, was, he did a really nice job. He didn't skip that verse. And there's a lot of stuff in the Bible that we have to teach that you kind of like to skip sometimes. You don't mind applying it to yourself, but am I really going to sit out here with 600 people in the chairs and, and say this? So, courageous, differentiated, talking with people rather than at them or to them. It's the sense of, what am I feeling like in the chairs when I'm listening to you? Do I feel like you're talking at me? Or, or just to you? Or with you? Do I feel like this person is connected with me? And, and it's a massive thing. It's, it's not easy to do. So um, this is a, a major c conviction of mine. Everyone who's listening to you is all stocked up on condemnation. They don't need any more of that. They got it from Satan. They got it from the parents. They got it from neighbors. They got it from school. And mostly they got it from themselves. Everybody's stocked up on that. Arrogant speakers. We don't need another one of those. Dishonesty hypocrites, cowards, and lectures. Um, I mean, I won't ask you to do it, but I think if I said, are you, would you guys, was any of you like more of this? <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. The stance I'm taking toward people is critical. Next one, please, honey. Critical importance of language style. So language style is a challenging uh, situation because the best communicators work very hard at how they're going to say stuff. So we're talking about word choice, word order, sentence structure, use of word pictures, metaphors, figures of speech. Now, this can deteriorate into cute, clever, uh, alliteration. Not, there's nothing wrong with alliteration, but you can go way too far. I've seen sermons that the outline was, you know, everything was an A, but the third one and the fourth one were like, now, that's a stretch. There's no... <laughs> I know it's an A word, but it doesn't mean what the passage means. So you've got to be careful you don't get too cutesy here. But saying stuff that is in a rememberable way. So John the Baptist says to the, to the Pharisees who are coming out to be baptized, he says to them, you know, you're going to be judged. But how did he say it? The axe is already laid to the root. It was powerful powerful way to say that. Uh, I am embarrassed to say that I one time discharged a pistol in my kitchen. I came home from hunting. I had my 22 on my belt. I pulled it out. It was still loaded. I didn't check it. I put it on a magnet that was on the freezer. It went boom. Man, it makes a loud noise in a one-bedroom apartment. Boom. Went through the refrigerator door lodged in a pound of frozen ground round. I preached that one time. Lodged in a pound of frozen ground round. Uh, it's rememberable. Not as rememberable as to Kathy and me who were sitting in the kitchen, but extremely rememberable. And to finish the story, my dad was a, a gun nut who had hammered gun safety into me all of my life, and he was coming to visit. And we had a big old door, a big old hole in the freezer door. And I went to get a new one, they can't get it for two weeks. I taped, I don't mean I put it over with a magnet, I taped a shopping list over that, <laughs> over that hole. My, my, my father, God rest his soul, went to his grave without knowing that. I am stinking happy about that. <laughs> um, that's that. Issues of delivery. Okay. <clears throat> you, you've got these sections of work here. You've got personal preparation, am I prayed up? You've got look at the text, do I understand what this means? You've got form the message, what's the structure? What's the introduction? What's the conclusion? What are the transitions? And then you've got to deliver it. You've got to stand up and give it to people. And that uh, is, has plenty of pitfalls in it. So here's my thoughts on that. Number one, 
reviewing and rehearsing your message. The better you know the material, the better you can deliver it without stammering, without stage fright, without uh, being so completely tied to your notes that you're just reading it. And so when, when I do a message like this coming Sunday, uh, I'm, I'm speaking at The Pursuit. And my typical, my typical approach is I will review the message completely three times on Saturday and once on Sunday morning. Now, I still speak from notes. I had a time in my ministry I spoke without notes. And it was a huge amount of work. And then it got to be terrifying. <laughs> I'm on the platform one Sunday morning, Christ Community Church, Idaho Falls, Idaho. And I stand up and say, uh, folks, today, I want to turn your Bible to Mark 5. And I turn my Bible to Mark 5. It wasn't Mark 5. <laughs> and I drew an immediate blank. I couldn't remember my sermon, the passage, or anything. Most terrifying time I ever had on a platform. And a woman in the front row said, Dave, you mean Luke 5. Oh, yes, I do. Luke 5. And so I went to Luke 5, found my own passage, and spoke from it. Uh, I could still be standing there crying at the, today, but the woman saved my life. So I don't speak without notes anymore, but I try to have my message so well down that it's not obvious that I'm using notes, and I'm certainly not doing this with notes the personal, the, the personal appearance is the next thing. That is the issue of how do I look up here, you know? There's a book written years ago called You Are the Message. You Are the Message. And when you stand up to speak somewhere, now it's, it's less so when you're the pastor who comes up on the platform every Sunday. But when a guest speaker comes up there, uh, the way they appear has a huge impact on immediately what you think about them. Are they dressed in the way that our speakers normally dressed? Did they comb their hair? Are their shoes polished? Uh, are, are they got holes in their jeans? What, what all is going on here? Uh, I went to see a speaker one time. It's a Saturday morning, 6 a.m., a men's breakfast at a Dairy Queen in Glen Ellen, Alaska. And I go in there, and I sit down, and the speaker comes in, and he is a... Um, a guy who lives in the, in the bush off the, off the grid, Christian man, loves God ridiculously. And he had obviously gotten up and dressed in the dark because his T-shirt was on inside out. And the tag was sticking up in his beard right here. And, <laughs> you know, I'm sitting here thinking, I got out of bed at 5.30 on a Saturday to see a guy who doesn't put a shirt on, you know. That's my condemnation anger. My, my condemnation arrogance, I mean. Now, he went on to give a... a extremely compelling Bible message. But, but I'm just sitting there looking at him. When, you, when your tag is sitting up here, it's hard to pay attention. You are the message. And so you've got to be careful how you stand up there to give the communication. Uh, audience rapport. Do people feel like you're connected with them, that you care about them, that you're at ease with them? Personal credibility and authority. Am I a person that you want to listen to because you respect me? Stage presence. It's not something that can be taught, but it can be learned. Stage presence. You have all heard sp seen speakers who came up on the stage and they get behind the platform, they get behind the podium like this, and they've got a death grip on it, and you can see the podium shaking, and they're scared out of their minds, and you're anxious for them, and you're going, what's going to happen here? Dear God, help him. Dear God, help him. And, you know, everybody's anxious. It's just a mess. Uh, it can't be taught, but it can be learned. And uh, the very first time I ever did anything in church, I was about 18 years old, and I went to a church where they had a gospel reading, and they put me in a robe, and they had me read the gospel. I was so anxious that my hands were shaking. The robe was shaking like this. My brother was on the front row laughing his head off. I'm just, <laughs> I don't know how I got through it. But I was 18, and now I can stand up here without, without doing this. Uh, you can learn stage presence, and it's a massive issue because people want to know that you're accustomed to being up there and that you're calm and that you know what you're doing and they're not sitting there ridiculously anxious for you. Eye contact. Speakers look at people. No, I'm sorry. Communicators look at people. Speakers look at notes. The more I'm looking at you, the more you think, 
A, he cares about me. B, he knows what he's doing. C, he has some level of expertise. And it's not to say that everybody who uses notes or even uses them too much is a bad person, but to the degree that I'm looking at you, to that degree you think, okay, he's, he's, he knows what he's up to here. Uh, mastery of material, does he really know what he's talking about? Physical objects, about 25 years ago in my church in Idaho Falls, I took the pulpit away because, because I found myself standing behind here like this. And I am, there's a barrier between me and you. Now, this is a personal philosophical thing. Chad's a good person, he stands up here, he likes it. Jason stood up here all the time. No problem, no problem. But I went to, I went to the church where Jason's pastoring now, when I went there, it's gone now. But they had a pulpit that one of the guys had built and it was, it was so big, and I'm 6'4", friends, and I felt like a child behind it. It's like, you know, I need a booster seat to get over it. It was huge. It was massive, and it was wide. And you stood behind that thing, and you looked like a guy who was kind of crouching down in a snowball fight. You know, I mean, they, there was a big barrier between you. I took it away, and I took the one away in my previous church. And if you see me speak here on a Sunday morning, I don't use this. I stand here. I got my stuff in my Bible because I want to be as closely connected to you as I can be, as opposed to I'm behind a, a physical barrier and that's creating some uh, level of, of distance. So here's a massive issue, friends. Physical objects in the way, movement. Am I moving? Am I moving too much? Am I moving too rhythmically? When I saw a guy speak at Jason's church uh, before Jason became pastor and he would do about three sentences and we'd go over here. Three sentences, you see this, Jonathan? Go over here. Three sentences over here. I mean, this went on the whole sermon long. And I'm just like, I'm going nuts. Not because I'm a Bible communicator, but because I'm not, you know, I'm at a tennis match, you know? It's it just driving me nuts. There are certain movements and physical mannerisms that can drive people nuts. We had a pastor in, in, in Texas. He had his coins in his pocket. He jingled them all sermon long. And you're sitting there listening to those coins going like, you know, I wasn't at a place to speak to him. I was a seminary student. But if I'd have been <laughs> more than that, I would have said, John, don't put any coins in your pocket. Um, varied gestures. When you communicate, the, the bigger your gestures, the better, and the more varied, the better. My very first sermon was videoed at Dallas Seminary. And they showed us the video, and the professor speeded it up. And all my gestures were right here. Like, you, put, you could put a, a box of 12 inches around every gesture I did. I never pointed up like that. I never did this. I never went like this. I never did anything. It was just like everything was right, right there. And the more varied my gestures, the more you feel like I, I'm at ease here. And, and I say, listen, you know, you can go way over there. But if I say you can go way over there, but I'm not, you know, doing the way over there, you think, um, wake up a little bit there. Varied volume, varied rate, varied pitch. Too many speakers don't ever vary anything like I'm doing tonight with my rapid fire pitching, getting through this message. Pauses. Do I ever have the ability to just stop and ask a question and, and let it soak in for a second? Even maybe make you nervous for a second. Dis distracting manager mannerisms, we talked about that. Verbal garbage. Um, 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 um. I mean, it's hard to break, but I have known some. Uh, is my use of humor appropriate? Humor can be very helpful to, to build rapport, to release tension after a particularly difficult point, uh, to point to, to, to be self-depreciating can be very helpful, but it can also be way overdone, way overdone. It becomes humor for humor's sake. Uh, did I arrive at the venue on time? Uh, did I have my materials ready? Was I respectful and appreciative of the people working here like Stephen? Um, did I, did I move into the process that was happening on that morning? Like, I'll, I'll be at uh, Pursuit next week, God willing. And, and even though I also go to that church, I'm a guest speaker. And I've got to show up when the mic, when the mic uh, check happens. And I've got to be there at the prayer time when they pray together at the beginning. And I've got to know when it's my turn to get up. And I've got to figure out, how do I live into their process so that I'm not causing a mess of their Sunday morning? Uh, those are some of the issues of this issue of uh, issues of delivery. Now, we have a little more time, and so I want to ask you, do you have anything to say, ask, or anything about what I've said so far? And I know there's a train load there. We're going to move to page four, but 
Thoughts, questions, comments? What was your one point? The gallon of milk. <laughs> what, what, uh, yeah, thank you so much. Matt, you don't want to mess with an old guy because he just, he, he gets like a deer in the headlights. He can't remember what passage he was on. I love you too, my brother. See, it's quite stark, doesn't it? Yeah. And, you know, this is a personal philosophical thing with me in terms of removing the physical distance, removing the objects, and I also think about removing the height. In other words, I'm way above you guys. And, you know, we're doing this for video, of course. If, if we weren't videoing this, I would be far, far further down there, and, and I think that's important. Now, this is personal philosophy. It doesn't come out of the Bible, but... In Idaho Falls, when I thought about this and made this decision, I took the pulpit away completely, and it was just a little podium. I took it away completely, and I had him build a, a platform about this big that was a one step off down the stage, and so I'm preaching one step lower, and I'm a couple of steps, three steps closer, and there's no pulpit in front of me. And it, it just it made a lot of difference. Now, the first few Sundays for me was terrifying, like when I'm reading the gospel, you know, like... There's nothing to hold on to. There's nothing to hide behind. I'm just exposed out here. Now, I got used to it. And <clears throat> if you see me preach on here on Sunday morning, I might lay my Bible on here, but I don't, I don't have any sense of, okay, I'm anxious because there's no pulpit to hold on to. You know. Now, <laughs> I'm, I'm a little anxious right now because Chad's not here. <laughs> and, you know, Chad's his own man. He can do what he wants to do, obviously. Um, so he may be behind the pulpit. Yes, ma'am. Uh, my, my dear friend Sherman wants to emphasize that this one central point is much like what you've encouraged us to do in sharing the gospel. Yes. Yes. Thank you for thank you for making that correlation. Yeah. As I said on that night when I was teaching how to share the gospel, first time I was asked, I have. Beautiful opportunity to share the gospel. I spoke for 20 minutes. Made a mess of it. Made a mess of it. What do you need to know about the gospel? Sin, separation, substitution, trust. If you know those four words, you got the gospel. And if you got the gospel, you can give it to somebody else. I wish I, I wish I'd, I'd known that 50 years ago when Mark Lennon asked me, you know. All right, for, oh, Matt, my friend. Three or four weeks to go 
Yeah. Uh, so how would you determine that? And okay, you can ask a second question, but you can't ask Dave two in a row. You gotta let him finish one. Because I'm like, <laughs> a gallon of whole milk, and what was the second thing, Matt? Uh, so, the, so the answer to that question is, when I was preaching, I did what I call a, a preaching calendar. I sat down uh, late in the year and, and prayed and thought and said, you know, Lord, what do you want me to do this coming year in a preaching calendar? I, I was a huge fan of having the year mapped out. I do not like coming to Monday morning and saying, oh, what should we do this week? You know, I, I just hate that. So I would, I would typically mix up Old Testament and New Testament. I would tip, typically mix in a few topical ones, although they weren't my favorite, but I did some on the family and some other topics, but I typically did Bible books. So in, in terms of how, how much would I preach on a given Sunday, I was always asking myself the question, where's the first pericope? Where's the first unit of thought? And I would literally, Part of the way I would do that is I would take like five Bible translations and I would write where their translators broke the paragraphs and see if there was a good correlation or not. But I was always fighting for what's the single pericope which has a single idea in it, which I can teach as a single idea. That was my main operation in that. Now, I've been assigned to preach at some places where I go, there's 41 verses here. This is three pericopes, you know. And I try to live into their stuff, but... It's almost ridiculous, you know. You talk about hitting the high points. Second question. You answered about Beautiful. You're welcome. Okay, friends, flip over to page four, please. Uh, I'm, I'm just trying to give you a little idea of, of, of how some of these things might, might look that I've talked about in the first three pages. So Psalm 73 is, in my judgment, I don't know if Kathy Gibson feels the same way, the best sermon I ever did. Partly because I resonated with it, partly because I studied it a lot, partly because I've preached it a lot. Probably more than any sermon, maybe. I mean, I've done King David and Goliath a lot. I've got a few of these, what, what a preacher calls a road sermon, you know, when you get a chance to preach and you don't have a whole lot of time and you just gotta show up with something. So, so, so this is one of them that I have done a lot partly because I just love the psalm, partly because it resonates with my own soul. It's just a massive issue to me. So the first thing I said was, um, you want to you wanna have your introduction hook people. You have about 90 seconds max. The first 25 words are critical. You want to hook them. You want to raise some problem. You want to keep them with you. You want it to be interesting. So, so here's what I did with, with Psalm 73. I would pray... And then when I got done praying, I'd be standing over here. Now, friends, part of why I stand on this side and not that side is because uh, when, when you're looking this way, this is, this is youngest to oldest. We read left to right. This is the beginning of time. That's the end of time. Does that make sense? So not for me it's not because I'm looking this way, but for you as you're looking at me, I'm starting out here at, at young. And so I say, uh, life's not good. This is what's called a cold open. I don't, introduce, I don't give any introduction of what's about to happen here. It's a cold open. When they look up from the prayer, I'm standing here and I say, life's not good for me right now because I've got a wet diaper. Life will be good when I get a dry diaper. Then I step over here and say, life's not good for me right now because my brother hid my baseball mitt. Life will be good when I get my baseball mitt. Life's not good for me right now because I didn't get the teacher I wanted in second grade. Life will be good for me when I get that right teacher. Life's not good for me right now because I didn't make the volleyball team. Life will be good for me when I get in the volleyball team. Life's not good for me right now because I don't have a girlfriend. Life will be good for me when I have a girlfriend. Life's not good for me right now because I'm not getting along with my girlfriend. Life will be good when I get along with my girlfriend. Life's not good for me right now because I didn't get into college I wanted. Life will be good when I get in the college I want. And I go all the way across the stage like that. I start with a toddler, and I'm upset. Life is not good for me because I've got a wet diaper. And when I get over here, I say, life's not good for me right now because my kids are making me live in this care home. Life will be good for me when I get out of this care home. Life's not good for me right now because I've got a wet diaper. Life will be good when I get a dry diaper. Okay. 
I have gone all across the stage, and then I say, friends, I did all of that. I said all of that to ask you this one question. When is life good for you? When is life good for you? What is your definition of the good life? Well, there was a writer 3,000 years ago whose name was Asaph. He was a worship leader in the temple in Jerusalem, and he had a massive personal fight with that question. And he records that fight in, that fight in, Matthew, in, in Psalm 73. And I want you to look at that with me to see the fight he went through and to you to answer your own question, when is life good for me? Okay, so that's my illustration of my introduction. Where rather than saying, okay, last week we're in Psalm 72, this week we're in Psalm 73. I want to do something compelling, something to hook you. I want to ask you this question, when is life good for you? It's an important question. Psalm 73 answers it. So then uh, after I've asked that question, then I'm going to do a transition and say, Asaph wrestles with this question in a very compelling way. That basically means we're done with the introduction. Now we're going to go see Asaph's wrestling match with the question. First, uh, it's, it's on your outline there if you want to watch. Here's what Asaph believes. He says, the good life is certain for those who love God well. If you love God well, your life will be good. Your life will be blessed. You will have money. You'll be happy and you will be healthy. And you'll see that he comes to that all the way through that. So this is his theology of the good life. I obey and God blesses me. That's what he believes. Unfortunately, here's my transition, that's not what he experienced. What he believes doesn't match up with what he sees. Then I go to verses 2 to 12. Asaph sees the wicked prosper and his own life flounders. And he has these piles of evidence that wicked people are prospering. They never have any trouble. They're not in trouble like other men. Their eyes bulge from fatness. It's a figure of speech. It means they look at stuff that doesn't belong to them, and they want it, and they take it. He says they are fat. In America, we say, well, that's not good. But in that culture, it meant they were rich. They could hire servants. They didn't work the fields anymore. They sat in the gates and talked to the other fat men. And life was great for them. And so, so Asaph just goes through this whole list of reasons why their lives are great, even though they're wicked and violent people. And his life is horrible, even though he has loved God well. This is the dissonance in his mind that he's struggling with. Then, transition again, he makes a logical and utterly false conclusion. And here it is, verses 13 and 14. I have served God in vain. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure. That means I've worked on the inner part of my spiritual life. Surely in vain I have washed my hands. That means I've done the temple rituals. I've gone to the temple and washed my hands. I did everything. I worked on my heart, the inner part, and the outer part. And I have wasted my life. He's extremely upset about that. Uh, so then he asked the question, you know, why did I do this? Um, you're driving across southern Idaho. It's uh, July 9th. The temperature is 109. The air conditioner is out of your car. You've got the windows down. You're going 70 miles an hour. The wind is beating on you this hot 109 degree wind is beating on you. You're turning into a prune. You hit that one uh, rest stop over there by, I don't know, Gooding or somewhere in there. And you pull in, you're just parched. You go to the soda machine, you put in three bucks. You push the button for Coke. You can just feel that caffeine burn on the back of your throat. You push the button, clunk, but it doesn't come out. It's not the right sound to clunk, it's not out. You reach in, you shake the machine, it doesn't come out. And then you're on your hands and knees, you're reaching up in the machine like a veterinarian delivering a calf. I've got to have this Coke. And you're just going nuts. And then there's an 800 number you can call. And in about four hours, somebody will be out from Gooding to give you your three bucks back. And you walk off just torqued off. I put in my three bucks, and I didn't get my Coke out. Asaph said, I put in my obedience and I didn't get my blessing out. His heart is wrapped around the axle. He is so deeply discouraged. And so <clears throat> then he has his eyes open, and here's where the story turns, verses 15 to 22. He gets recalibrated. 
Now I see that the wicked perish in a flash. It says he came into the sanctuary and he got recalibrated. Who's in the sanctuary? God. Who's the one utterly true being in the universe? God. Where do we get recalibrated about truth? In connection with God. Every one of us believes false and frankly stupid stuff. If we knew what it was, we'd quit it. We'd stop. We just don't know what it is. God's the only one who believes everything true. And Asaph came into the sanctuary, and in the sanctuary with the one sane being in the universe, he got recalibrated, and he saw the wicked are destroyed in a flash. He used these bunch of great metaphors. He says, they're swept away like a sailor swept off overboard. They're, they're gone like a dream in the morning. You get up in the morning, you say, I had this most bizarre dream. I'm going to tell my wife. And you go, honey, I had this amazing dream last night. I don't know what it was. It's gone. That's how the wicked are. They're just gone. And Asaph finally understood that. So he's fully recalibrated, and he comes to a different conclusion, verses 23 to 28. That's my transition. The nearness of God is my good. He redefines the good life. It's not the wealth and the health and the happiness and no troubles. It's being close to God. That's the good life, period. The man's heart and mind are completely changed. And then I say, here's a transition. What about us? Uh, where are we in this issue of the good life? How do I define the good life? Do I understand that the good life is being close to God? Or is there something else that I believe? Here's the core truth. The nearness of God is my good. My friend Ray Nixon, if I were to see him today, he would say to me, Dave, the nearness of God is my good. You got it, Ray. You got it. Where's that come from, Ray? I have no idea. It's Psalm 73, 23 to 20, or 25 to 28. It doesn't matter. He took away the idea, and we want to take away the idea, this simple, concise truth. And then, in the conclusion, we try to show them the idea as they have never seen it. The nearness of God is my good. Here's what I did with that conclusion. I said to them, <clears throat> I went to, my, my first year of Greek, we had a student in there named Chad Bitterman, Chet. Chet Bitterman was a fellow student of mine. Do you know the name Chet Bitterman? Yeah. So Chet uh, became a, a Wycliffe Bible translator. He went down to South America translating the Bible. Captured by leftist guerrillas, taken into the jungle, tied up in an abandoned bus, and executed in the back of the head. There's a book about him called, it's a good book, I forgot the name of it, Chet Bitterman. And so I say to the people, I tell them that story, and then I say, listen, friends, I don't think this will ever happen to us. But if you ever get tied up in an abandoned bus and you know you're going to be executed, let me give you a piece of advice from God the Holy Spirit through Asaph. Lean your head against the glass, close your eyes, take a deep breath, calm your heart, and say to yourself, the nearness of God is my good. I don't think that's going to happen to you. Here's what's more likely to happen. You're coming home from work one day. It's been a miserable day at work. You had a bunch of conflict with the boss. You're tired. You're exhausted. It's drizzling cold rain. Your car dies. You drift off the off-ramp, and you park on the edge, and you call AAA, and they say, yeah, we'll have somebody there in three hours. You're sitting in the car with this cold drizzle coming down. It's a miserable day. Let me give you a piece of advice from God the Holy Spirit through Asaph. Lean your head against the glass, close your eyes, take a deep breath, calm your heart, and say to yourself, the nearness of God is my good. Let me tell you what could happen to you. You could work for three years on a, on a product, a, a software product, or a book, or, or a, a business, or something, and it could go extremely well, and you could fly down to Denver and negotiate for two days, and with one signature, your personal net worth could go up $7 million with one signature. And so you go to the airport, you celebrate by upgrading to first class, you're leaving Denver, the lights of Denver are getting smaller. Let me give you a piece of advice from God the Holy Spirit through a man named Asaph. Lean your head against the glass, close your eyes, take a deep breath, and say to yourself, the nearness of God is my good. It doesn't matter if you're about to be executed in a bus. 
you're waiting for the tow truck or you've just become a multimillionaire. The nearness of God is my good. So that's what I try to do with that message to say, okay, let's show the same idea in a more compelling way than just saying it over again. Thoughts or comments about any of that? Kathy. Right. That is a brilliant question. Thank you. Yeah, my wife just said, most of us are never going to preach a sermon or even necessarily teach a Bible class. How do we use these principles like in our family? Let, let me give you one example. <clears throat> uh, I have a granddaughter whom I love desperately. She's 17 years old. She's given to discouragement and depression. And, and she just, she's just down on herself because she thinks the world is down on her. And I have made it my mission to be her source of grace. And I am habitually saying to her, Rachel, God is crazy about you. And so is Grandpa. I'm thinking of ways to communicate with her what's true and what's rememberable. God is crazy about you. He can't help himself. He's for you incessantly, incurably. And so is Grandpa. So that's my, that, that's my mantra. God's crazy about you and so am I. And I'm trying to reiterate that with her. And I'm trying to say it in the ways that are rememberable. I don't, I don't want, to, I want to say, well, you know that the Bible says God really likes you, really loves you. God's really for you. I want to say he's crazy about you. He can't help himself. So that, that's one application to it, possibly. Are you thinking of applications? Yeah, that, that's another application of it that's just been so compelling to me uh, because, because I have used it myself, especially in difficult conversations, to figure out what is the main thing this person needs to know. If we talk for an hour or three hours, what is the one thing they have to take home? I have used that habitually, and it has been very helpful. I have probably coached five people this year to that. People call me up and say, X, Y, or Z is happening here or there or wherever. And, and I say, figure out the mantra. What is the most important thing to say? What does this person need to hear? How can you say it in a rememberable way and say it until they're sick of it? So they can go home with something to think about. Because you can't remember anything besides a gallon of whole milk. Other thoughts or comments, friends? That took longer than I thought it would. I was going to let you out early. Sorry. All right. I will pray for us. Thank you so much for coming out this evening. Next Wednesday night, 7 p.m., Dr. Howard Foreman, uh, Roots and Shoots, a discussion of Protestantism in America. It will be ridiculously interesting as he talks about all the different directions that denominations and theology and, and groups have gone in America. It's pretty interesting stuff. Let me pray for us. Lord, I'm really grateful for this evening, really grateful for these people. Thank you for our time and our chance to think together about these things. Uh, I, would be, I pray we'd be people who leave here at least remembering the nearness of God is my good. Thank you for Stephen and his diligent work. Thank you for my wife changing the slides. We're really grateful for your goodness to us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Friends, if you want past handouts and you will write your email on a piece of paper for me, I will email them to you. I don't have any of last week's or the week before with me.